It was just like someone unplugged me from the wall and I just fell into a dark pit. I just had no energy to do anything and ended up in a really huge time of suicidal depression. I tried to write my farewell letter, but I was just so distraught that I couldn't write it properly and then the phone rang. And Is there anything that anyone could have done to help you get through that period? It's so easy to just want to fix people. But I think that the greatest thing we can do for anyone with depression is... I knew it was time to record my first album. Everything in me said, yep, go and do it. And I had all my musicians lined up and everything else, but I didn't have any money to do it. I had hardly any money to do it. It's certainly not enough to to record it, but it was just such a strong guidance within me, just like, yes, and do it. So I just started getting organized and got everyone in place. And that included my producer, who was also my guitarist. And he was a married man with two kids. He, he had big financial responsibilities and time responsibilities. And, and then it got up to, I went away on a little singing camp for a couple of days in anticipation. And we were due to start on the Monday. I was moving into a house, uh, my favourite house sit, and I was house sitting a lot then, into my favourite house sit that weekend. But on the Friday, before we were due to start, I still didn't have the money and I was $5,000 short, which is a lot of money to come up with out of the blue. And, uh, and I started, it had been building for about a week, like, okay, I followed this, I've honoured this, but I am getting really, really scared here because I've got to pay this guy and I've got to pay all the other musicians. and what am I going to do? And so on the Friday evening, I went and sat on my meditation cushion in a panic, really, just in such a panic thinking, what am I going to do? I'm, I was really scared, very, very scared. And, uh, and so I meditated and just said, you know, I'm not really standing. I don't know what to do. And, and I just got, let it go. Just let it go. Go out and have a, uh, just forget about it for tonight. Go out and have a good night. And so I went out with, with a mate and, uh, I was going, I had planned to go and see a band and I was on my, going to do it on my own. And, uh, then a friend got in touch and said, she wanted to go to this bookshop that has a cafe and how about we go there? I said, yeah, sure. Let's do that. So it felt like a, a good distraction from my own head to be with someone else. And then she ran into another friend of hers. And while my mate was like, our mutual friend was off looking at the, um, at the books, I sat down with, with her friend and we just got chatting and. She said, you know, tell me about your life. Um, my life's really awful. It's crap at the moment. That's what she said. My life's crap. Tell me about your life right now. And I said, well, actually, my life's pretty crap too right now. I said, I'm waiting on a miracle and I'm, I'm right at the 11th hour and I'm really scared and I don't know what I'm going to do. So tell me about your life instead. And she said, no, no, I want to hear about yours. Tell me what, what is all this about. And so I just said, well, I'm due to start recording my album on Monday and I don't have any money and I'm, you know, I need, I need at least $5,000 and I'm really scared and I don't know what to do, but I just felt my heart just said to do this and get on with it. And she said, well, my life is crap because I'm going through a really shocking divorce and I've wanted to support the arts for years and my husband wouldn't let me support the arts. So I'm going to use the money I've, I'm getting from him to support the arts, I'm going to turn up on Monday morning at your house with $5,000 in cash. <laughs> and, she, and she did. And, uh, yeah, I just burst into tears, of course. And, and I just thought to myself, how do we ever question it? Because we don't need it before we need it. And I got it when I needed it. But we always think we need it before that. And I'd had little leaps of faith prior to that time. And I'd always landed on my feet. Someone, you know, there was always a solution was presented at the, at the last minute. But because this one was so large and involved so many other people, it just seemed huge. But it just taught me that we only think we need the money a month before or a week before or whatever because it's for our own security. But life just knows that You'll get it when you, you know, it'll come if you get out of the way. I'm trying to give it to you, but get out of the way. And so, yeah, she turned up and she, she just said, I just want to have my name on, um, 
the album cover as the executive producer. So I said, sure. And she just came in, didn't want to get involved, just lay on the floor on the, the thick lush carpet of this house and we sat there while we started recording the album and came to the launch and yeah, and see, didn't stay in touch or anything, was just quite detached from the whole process, but was a, a guardian, you know, was, was an angel. Was this when you were still doing the palliative care or was it, yes. did the album come out then? So how, how did, how did it go? Um, it was okay. Um, I wasn't really confident. I, I, you know, it was the start of me trying to back myself and I'm really proud of what I put out there considering how vulnerable and broken I was at the time. Um, it was well received. A couple of the songs got got a little bit of airplay in Australia, and uh, and I got into some folk festivals to play at, just small folk festivals. But I never really made it hugely in Australia, and uh, and my heart was just I hated going to gigs at ten o'clock at night and playing in pubs, and yeah, it, it was a hard road. But my music was was such a joy to me. Besides that aspect of it, yeah. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. You told this story in your book about what you just gave a kind of metaphor for the typical drunk Aussie guy who would come up in front of you on the stage and pretend like he was God's gift to women. And you went through this whole thing. It was really funny. Just wanted to put that out there. Did you feel like you were living your purpose at the time? When you were I doing the palliative care and, and the music and the trying to do the photography and all of that, how, how, how closely were you aligned with what you felt was your purpose? I felt I was because I was honoring my creative talents and I was making a difference in the world in a way that wasn't selling insurance to people in the bank. As long as it wasn't anything to do with banking, uh, yeah, I did. I, I felt like I was on the right path and I was meditating two hours a day, an hour morning and afternoon, and I was very, very connected to my inner guidance, but I, um, I had no idea that, that I would be called onto the author's path. And I am so grateful for that, that I could get my message out there in a way that's much more suitable to my quiet nature than playing in really loud pubs. Yeah. And at the time you kind of, I guess, saw yourself just, I'm going to be house sitting and nomading and, you know, taking up little jobs here and taking a little time off in between clients to reboot and trying to do some creative pursuits here and there. That's, that's kind of what you saw for yourself for the next foreseeable future. Yes. Yeah. I, a friend, my cousin's friend who I used to play music with a bit, he said to me one night, well, you've got to settle down sometime, Bronnie. And I said, do I? Why? And he said, well, everyone does. And I said, no, not everyone does. And he said, okay, tell me then, what, where would you like to be when you're 50? And I think I was about 30 at the time, you know, where would you like to be? I said, oh, I'd love to own a motor home. <laughs> but uh, I did actually find a settled bone in my body years later. But yeah, yeah. that was where I was at back then, right? I was just, just drifting and letting life take me wherever it wanted to go. Well, you eventually um, graduated yourself from the palliative care work and you've got yourself settled into a college, a cottage. Um, and that was another great story. We don't have to get into that because there's so many great stories, but you, you got all this secondhand furniture. It was like timed perfectly without trying to time it. And it just, just all kind of came together. And that's right at the beginning of the sort of songwriting for prison in prison, the women's prisons um, endeavor for which you had zero experience teaching people, you had no budget. And how did that all come together? I just got this really absurd idea one day when I was with a patient that I wanted to teach songwriting in a jail. And That's I think so it was random. I know. I know I'd never been inside a jail in my life. I knew no one who'd been inside a jail. I, I have no idea what that was about, but, uh, I, I, the only thing I could put it down to is I wanted to work where there was some hope. And so at least if I was helping people in jail, they, ha they could have some hope to improve, improve their life. I'm not sure. I, I, I really don't know. It was just a guided thing. And so through one of my patient 
friends. I ended up finding some funding for a jail. Um, it took about a year or so, but she had said to me, because this, this patient was really hard work and a very authoritarian woman and she'd been, uh, she was just really hard work. And, and so her friend said to me, I've seen how you look after her. If you can do that, you can do anything. I'll, I'll help you find the funding. And I thought, okay, great. Thank you. So we had to find like an auspice organization, charity organization to fund the donation through the, the uh, philanthropic grant that I got. So yeah, I taught in a jail. I went to a jail um, and said that I'd like to set up a songwriting program and that I was working on finding some funding. And they said, sure, that sounds fine. Because to them, I was a volunteer, so I was offering something for nothing to them. And I was supposed to have all this security training and everything else I found out six months into the job, but, but I hadn't. And one day someone said, how come you've got your handbag with you one in the staff area? And I said, well, I'm just going to put it in the locker. And they said, yeah, but you can't bring your handbag in. And I said, why not? I, I have every week for the last six months. And, and they said, you have to empty your contents and put them in a plastic bag so we can, so they can be seen. And I said, oh, no one's ever stopped me. And they said. Oh, okay. So like, there were all these loopholes that, that just, the doors just opened for me and, uh, which was sort of good because I had actually snuck in a couple of CDs for them, for the, the students and, um, you know, cause they needed some music. Um, yeah, so I taught songwriting for healing to a beautiful group of women. And it was then that I actually realized how much I needed to be looked after myself because mm. they gave me so much love. I thought I was there helping them and I was in teaching them how to play the guitar and how to write basic songs, but that, I guess they were just, they were just sensitive, good hearted women who got lost along the way. And I received so much love and genuine care from them that they were healing me as much as I was healing them. But it was a really unexpected time, to be honest. And you had a bit of a dark night of the soul moment, um, a little bit after that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Suicidal so, thoughts and depression. Yeah, the works. Yeah. So I was, um, once the funding ran out from the jail, I, my energy was just getting lower and lower and my, uh, some new neighbors had moved in next door to the cottage I was living in and they were fighting all the time. So it wasn't a nice home environment either. And so I just had this calling to move back to the country and I hadn't lived in a rural area for years, like 25, 27 years or something. And, uh, and so I rented this house on a cattle farm, a vegan on a cattle farm. And, uh, and it was right by a creek and it was beautiful. And I just thought, I'll just have a little break. And I had a little bit of savings. I thought I have a break for a month or so, then I'll start looking for some sort of work. And during that time, I just, it was just like someone unplugged me from the wall and I just fell into a dark pit. I just had no energy to do anything and ended up in a really huge time of suicidal depression where I just felt like all the work I'd done on myself and all the acts of courage I'd taken and all the decisions I'd done that was honoring my heart was, and I still hadn't got, I felt like I hadn't got anywhere. I was like, okay, well, I'm still here. I'm still in pain, emotional pain. I'm still financially not strong. I'm still not knowing where I belong. And yeah. And so it got, it got really bad, um, shockingly bad. And but I found a, an amazing counsellor and counselling in those days wasn't as big in Australia as it is in, in the States. And so it was quite a, you know, something I, you know, I wouldn't tell anyone I was having counselling. It was that sort of stigma in those days. And she was just brilliant. She just said, what are you doing? You're trying to go for a gold medal in the Carers Olympic, you know, and you got to look after yourself. And she just helped me amazingly. But in the end, I did just reach a breaking point where I thought I can't live with this anymore. And I tried to write my farewell letter, which was really just to my mom in, in apology. And, uh, and I was, I worked out this road I was going to drive off and, uh, and I owned a van. So I was right at the, the windscreen, you know, you sit right at the front of the van. So I, I, I was all set to do it and in tears and trying to 
to write this, uh, scribble this letter, but I was just so distraught that that I couldn't write it properly. And then the phone rang, and uh, and I, I I I don't know why I picked it up because I normally don't pick up other like numbers I didn't know. I'd let it go to the message bank, and uh, and it was just this really ch- chirpy voice. Hello, is that Bronnie? And I'm like, yeah, who's this? I can't remember her name, but you know, it's so and so. And she was from a, a health insurance thing offering me ambulance insurance. And my number was silent. I hadn't given it out to anyone. I'd protected it for years. I'd always sort of been really private in, in my my personal details. And yeah, and here's this woman just ringing out of the blue and reminding me that, oh, I might not actually um, succeed in killing myself. I might, might actually need an ambulance and be even worse off. And yeah, then I just thought, oh, okay, okay. I just like no, I don't want any. I don't want any ambulance insurance thing. Thing just sat next time. not going to need it anymore. No, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I have a question about this experience. So you also mentioned that there was a friend of yours that would call you and he'd say funny stuff like, "You should better not be killing yourself right now." Yeah, is there anything that? anyone could have done to help you get through that period looking back on it now or maybe even thinking about how you were where you were at the time because i know a lot i just had a friend commit suicide recently and i was in touch with him and i knew he was having suicidal thoughts and i'm just curious from that vantage point where you're in it is it about people calling you more is there anything people can do to kind of help, or is it just a lost cause? And I'm obviously there are exceptions and everyone's thing is different, but just, I'm wondering what your experience was. Well, you you can't, um, escape yourself. So it doesn't matter how much support you might get from externally. You still have to deal with, with the internals, but meditation is probably what saved me for during the day I would still somehow sit and still have that sense of connection with divinity and think okay you know there's there's still love somewhere within me um but I think that the greatest thing we can do for anyone with depression is accept where they're at and not try to fix them because that puts a, a lot of pressure on people and we we are naturally good people the humanity is naturally good and wants to support each other and we do naturally care for each other and underneath all the other fear and nonsense but we are naturally good instinctively and it's it's so easy to just want to fix people but I think that acceptance is probably the thing that actually was the greatest act of love that I received because it, it made me feel, okay, I've got support there, but I've got support no matter what. And I don't have to pretend to be better today. And I don't have to take their advice. And, you know, a lot of friends dropped away because they just couldn't handle me. I, I was in that space for about six months. And, um, but those that stayed were just, they weren't trying to fix me. They were just like, well, how are you today? And oh, well, I'm, I can't swear, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not so good. Um, but then they wouldn't sort of, you know, say you've got to get out and meet more people or why don't you try this or try that because they knew me well enough to know I was giving it my best shot to heal as it was. And I think I just had to be, and I think at some point all of us have to be cracked open and that's how it came for me and it, it cracked me open through depression after giving for so many years and, and not receiving. And, um, and if we're trying to distract people from that lesson, I mean, some people like your friend won't come back from it and they will take their lives. But there's a lot of people who would go through depression that if they were given acceptance and the right environment to heal, eventually they would actually come through it and think, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm starting to come through this life's feeling a little bit just a you know a millimeter lighter today and the next day oh okay I'm feeling a little bit lighter and a veg it's not a it's not an overnight thing but you do yeah there there is a, a turning point I got a sense from your book that the depression for you just kind of lifted was it more more of a gradual process than what you articulated in the book 
No, I mean, it did lift. It, it lifted like the actual like suicidal thoughts, the the doom, the heaviness, that did lift for me. Absolutely it lifted. But what I mean is like this, it was still a gradual process to get back into life. Got to it. Find, to find my way back into being capable of of working. And so it was just like each day, like, okay, I'm feeling a little bit more capable today. Today I can, I can do this. You know, I could drive to town and have a conversation with this shop assistant or, or whatever. But yeah, it, my life transformed really quickly. And, um, and that's when my, my blog took off straight, almost immediately following that, where I just said, okay, I'm, I'm coming through, I'm through the worst of it. The, the ambulance time was a turning point and I knew then, okay, I'm not going to kill myself. I've got to that point where I was that close to doing it. I want to be, I want to value the gift of my life now. Show me how to live in a different way. And so that's how the clouds were lifted and, and my eyes were open to new colours and it was like the whole farm was illuminated, like I'd come off some really – like I'd been in a 20 day silent retreat or something and everything, all my senses were heightened and yeah, it, it was, it was pretty phenomenal for me how, how it all happened. So you had already started Inspiration and Chai at that point. Yes. I started that when I was teaching in the jail. So I'd been writing it all, all the way through. I, I, a lot of those articles aren't on the blog anymore, but yeah, I was still writing at least every, every couple of weeks for it. But I wasn't writing about me going through depression. I was writing mm -hmm. about beautiful things that were happening in nature and using that as a tool for teaching. Yeah. Cool. And talk about writing the top five regrets. What was, what inspired that article at the time that you actually sat down and wrote it? Why that okay. day? Yeah. Um, it was while I was in the jail and I'd, I'd come back from a really awful gig uh, and and I just didn't want to do any more gigs. And a music magazine had asked me to write an article about teaching in the jail. So I did that and then um, I wrote that for them. And then I thought, why aren't I writing more? I love writing, not just songwriting. You know, I love writing. I'll start a blog. And so, and I'd just been to some... Uh, a seminar thing that they were saying how to make money, you know, from being online. And one of those people was a blogger. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll start a blog and I could make money from that somehow. And uh, yeah, so I just thought, what do I write about? And I even Googled good blog topic. But instead, you know, my guidance inside just said, write what you know. And I thought, okay, well, I've just finished working with the dying people. Their regrets shape my life transformed my life over the last eight years, I'm going to write about their regrets because that's what, that was my biggest takeaway from all those years was how, how, how painful regrets are at the end. And so I just sat down and wrote it because I'd been mastering it and recognizing what the regrets were for eight years. And I put it on my blog while I was teaching in the jail. Then I went through this whole time of depression and, and suicidal thoughts. And then as I came out of that, as I was taking one step back and then the next step back, then the blog just took off. And uh, then I was offered a, a deal with an agent to get the book published. And so, you know, she just said, do you want to write a book? And I said, yeah, everyone's got a book in them. And, uh, and I said, I could only write this book if I wrote it as a memoir because death is so unrelatable for living people. And so I knew that if I wrote it as a transformation of my own life, then people would connect with that um, and death would become a bit more relatable through my, my exposure to it. And uh, yeah, so I signed to her, then it was rejected by 25 publishers. So I was released and so I, um, so I put it out myself. And then um, by then I was in a new relationship and I was pregnant. And then in the same 24 hours as my daughter was born, my, my dream publishing house Offered me a publishing deal and, uh, and then it became the, their fastest foreign rights seller in history, in Hay House history. So it's now in 32 languages with a, with a movie in the pipeline. And so we don't know, we don't know the seeds that, that we sow when we sow them. Cause that was in the cottage near the jail when I wrote that article and I still had to go through that massive healing process 
And what that did was it cracked me open and helped me let go of so much nonsense that had been holding me back. And, uh, yeah, it sort of. I have one question about your process when you were writing that article, because, you know, as a writer, you've been writing for decades, right? Every time you sat down, you wrote in your gratitude journal, you wrote in your regular journal, you're telling these stories, you're remembering these things. There must not have been anything different about that particular day and that particular post. And maybe before that, you were only getting, I don't know, you know, 30 people looking at your blog or something like that. When you were writing it out, the five regrets, did it come out as five regrets or did it come out, you just kind of listed all of the regrets and you said, well, let me kind of consolidate these into five different things. Like, did you already have that narrative in your consciousness before? Um, and you sat down and just wrote it out or did it just kind of, were you channeling it kind of like Neil Donald Walsh and his, his conversations with God experience? Like what was that process like? Well, I'd just been to this seminar about blogging and they had said, make sure you have good titles, top five, top 10, top whatever. <laughs> right. And so that's how that came about. Though initially I didn't even call it the top five regrets of the dying. I just called it regrets of the dying. And so it had been... I, I had already recognized five themes um, that had already happened naturally, that there were five themes, but I hadn't identified it to myself that there were five. It was just like, oh, here's that, I wish I hadn't worked so hard conversation again. I've had this conversation before. Oh, here's this one. This is, you know, because they came from different angles, I hadn't actually narrowed them down into five bullet points. And, but I also knew that there were these five common conversations, even though I hadn't numbered them. And so it was just because of this seminar, which I hadn't enjoyed at all, but it gave me the idea to put it into point form that I thought, okay, well, let me sit and think about this properly. And I sat down and I wrote out, you know, what each of the regrets were. I thought, oh, okay, there's five. And then I looked at a couple others. I thought, no, that's, that's the same as number one, but it, it's just said a bit differently. Oh, that's the name, the same as number four, but said a bit differently. And that's when I, yeah, I just got it, got it down to, to five. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.